We're doing a special gov sequence, just some logistical time zone scheduling we had to we had to iron out. Um, Lee and I are both in uh, undisclosed locations <laughs> at this time yeah. because this uh, this podcast has uh, done way is is they're coming after us. Um, it, it's done so well, yes, that I'm I'm on the run currently. So <laughs> that's the goal of government secrets is to make it so we're both on the run. I think. <laughs> I think ultimately is our goal. Um, you know, the people I feel bad for are, I have several fans who are on the run, but cause they think someone's after them, but there's actually no one after them. It sounds like a very exhausting life. It, I know there's a lot of people who are like hoping that that happens to them. Yeah, like yeah. I, I, had someone, I had someone emailed me just yesterday. It was like, it was like I, the, the government's after me, just like they are Snowden and Assange. And I'm like, yeah, it would, it's Snowden, Assange, and Diane Smith in Poughkeepsie. <laughs> yeah, Those are the three yeah. big ones. <laughs> That's funny. I had, um, I was talking to Susie Dawson, you know, who's a yeah. whistleblowing journalist. We've had her on both of our shows and, you know, and she's living in Moscow. And I was like, God, I hope they don't like come after me. She's like, Graham, I think uh, the NSA has, is not going directly for a Jimmy Dore panelist. I think they're worried. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're probably got other people on their mind. I, was like, I mean, okay. considering they let Tulsi Gabbard live, I think we're all right. <laughs> I think we're all right. I think they, Bernie Sanders is still alive. I think uh, a guy uh, with a undersized t-shirt in his apartment isn't that big of a threat i think um, i mean grant you're, you're listen your game shows did very well but i just don't think they broke <laughs> the level needed this out of work game show host is probably the top <laughs> threat that, that the united states has <laughs> to it oh god all right well, that's our soft opening in the government. I, I think we should make we should make that the soft opening. Absolutely, it is. It's a nice soft opening. Um, welcome to Government Secrets Episode Five. <laughs> soft opening with Lee Cap and Graham Elwood. <laughs> oh, the soft opening just got pretty intense. I feel like I like to ramp it up. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> since I'm a game show host on the run, you know what I mean. Right. I got to talk. I right. gotta just, Wouldn't it be great if you were still hosting a game show but on the run? So it was every <laughs> every weeks in a, like in a middle of a farm in a new country. Yeah, just a pop up in a basement. Yeah. All right, hey everybody! <laughs> so, some Romanian We're gonna see who can house. play. Who can name that tune from Armpit Farts? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've got a goat and a guy in a mask from some sort of local militia going to play our contestants tonight on <laughs> Game Show on the Run. <laughs> some sort of local militia. <laughs> hey, I tried to get him to put down the firearm during the game show, but was not successful. Oh... <laughs> uh... <laughs> <laughs> game show on the run ladies and gentlemen with grab elwood and technical support by the camp so you're just always in the studio during this <laughs> st we could still zoom you in even though i'm on the run from somewhere yes um, yes well and that's all the nsa has is that one hour where they try and learn everything about you <laughs> that's, the that's all they can get is government secrets <laughs> they're like god damn it he's still podcasting uh, so why is he still podcasting um there he is um uh all right i'm getting some people in the chat saying they can't hear you but i think i fixed it let me know if they can hear lee all, all of a sudden testing, testing one two there we go there we go everybody said thank you um it's fun i think i'm gonna try to intentionally have a sound problem every issue, every episode, <laughs> just so that, and then we should have an over under on how many people lose their shit in the chat. Like how quickly they just right. go, go, go. Like I just, I love that somebody thinks when they type one thing once, it ought, like it immediately goes into my soundboard and fixes it. I just, well, yeah, it, it, it turns out if they can't hear you, they're rather upset. If they can't hear me, they're actually rather excited. So they, they seem fine with that. <laughs> Keep Lee muted. Keep Lee muted. Please. I think with more sound problems. 
just like I see it and I change it. And then there's a delay from when we're actually recording to when they actually see it. And they keep flipping out. It's sort of like when you're like in a left turn lane and the person in the, in the, like you're, you're at the front and every, like the third, three cars behind you is honking and losing your shit. And I'm like, there's a woman with a baby carriage and I can't go left right in the crosswalk and you just right. settle down. And then they just, rah, 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 and it's like, there's a woman there. Oh, well, you still should have gone. Oh, okay. Well, you're a psycho. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and what if you were so what if peer pressure was so powerful to you you just really wanted to be liked that you were like all right we're doing this and you just gun it over the woman with the baby carriage and you're like i hope that guy behind me likes me now i'm the guy that honked i'm not responsible for my behavior um <laughs> all right let's get into government secrets our first segment segment number one uh, let, let, let's do it we got we got three or four topics for you and they're pretty they're pretty good this week they're hot and fresh um so this is actually, uh, the, uh, I, I found this, um, Kennedy's and the King, uh, there's a website called literally Kennedy's and the King, and it is going on Lisa, th- th- this particular article is going on Lisa Pease's has a book called A Lie Too Big to Fail, The Real History of the Robert Kennedy Assassination. And it's one of the more overlooked ones. Obviously, we all know about JFK. We know about the Magic Bullet. We know about the Grassy Knoll. We know about Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack yeah, Ruby and, for, and all of that. And for people that want more on JFK, uh, one of the best books is The Unspeakable. Uh, it's pretty great. I mean, it really goes through everything. Hmm. Okay. And... Um, yeah, I'm sure there's even more to uncover. I mean, it was the JFK assassination is when the CIA uh, came up with the term conspiracy theorist to make anybody asking questions just seem like a whack job and to lump anybody asking legitimate questions into the, you know, flat earth or, you know, we didn't land on the moon crowd, you know what I mean? To just make everybody become nuts. And and when you look at the JFKs and you look at the who is on the Warren Commission, oh, Jerem Ford was on the Warren Commission and people like that. Weird that he became a president. Um, <laughs> but the thing about and I just want to do a little back history for anybody, uh, any younger um, listeners or viewers who aren't that familiar with with Bobby Kennedy. Bobby was way more progressive than Jack. I mean, Bobby was the one who really started kind of coming around um, there's a great documentary on Netflix called Bobby Kennedy for president and really talks about his sort of evolution. Um, you know, JFK was still sort of Joe Kennedy's, you know, still in that sort of Joe Kennedy, do whatever you got to do to get, get, get power. And let's try to fix some things along the way where. Yeah. I mean, really both, both of them had an evolution over, over the course of JFK's presidency. Yeah, they did. Um, because Bobby was his attorney general, and and then after there was no his, nepotism there, though that was just no, a, a coincidence. No, no, he, earned he earned it. He earned it yeah. on merit. He absolutely earned it on merit. There's that like, like Ivanka Trunk, Trump. All right, she has fucking fought her way up from nothing to whatever it is she does now. Yeah. <laughs> and I will not stand for anyone saying otherwise. <laughs> she's, she's, all of them jared they've all yes. worked for it they've worked Listen, for it jared with his uh blank doll eyes and his uh <laughs> d- dimple this is this is a human being ho- so respo- uh, so repulsive that th- his dimples have evacuated his face i uh, they left <laughs> can't blank doll eyes if that's not the name of your next album lee i don't know <laughs> what you're doing i really don't know what you're doing <laughs> So, oh, blank doll eyes. Oh my god. Um, so that's the uh, best, speaking of conspiracy theories, that's the biggest conspiracy is where the fuck did Jared's dimples go? Have you seen those photos? He, oh, they he used to have, he, he used to have dimples in his cheeks, and now they're gone. And it's what? it's pretty bizarre. <laughs> oh my god. Maybe it's where like they stored Epstein's black book in his dimples, and that's just leveled it off. I think. Like, I think Peter Thiel, along with collecting everyone's urine, is collecting dimples from the ruling elite. <laughs> right, because they did some psychopathic studies showing dimples make you 
four right. percent less likely to earn money or something like that. So <laughs> they got to take your dimples away or something like that. They're going to need dimples on Elon Musk's space station when they all evacuate and leave us here. Which wouldn't <laughs> that be the greatest? If we could convince all of them, oh, get out! The planet's collapsing, and just get all the billionaires on some spaceship and they get out of here and then we blow it up out of the sky and then we all we can all come in reasonable Was people and fix the planet <laughs> i swear there was a either a show or a movie or a i'm having some vague deja vu of something where they made the simpsons but this i think the simpsons did it but they were basing it on something <laughs> else but where they 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 pile everyone into a ship to say they're going to save them and then they realize that that ship is the one they're going to blow up or something. <laughs> I don't remember that since this episode, but there's all, there was a Matt Damon kind of uh, dystopian future movie where there was this space station for the rich and everyone on earth was living in a, just a hell hole. Yeah. And he went up there to, I don't know, of course he was the hero or some shit. Anyway, let's get back to Bobby Kennedy. Uh, so um, uh, again, so Bobby was the one, the Vietnam War was in full swing. He was like, I'm getting us out of Vietnam. Uh, again, if you watch that Bobby Kennedy for President documentary on Netflix, it shows how he really evolved and was like fighting um, with uh, um, Chavez for workers' rights in the fields in California. He was really like fighting for people. He was the one that was saying... Um, it's not right that there's poor people and we're spending money right. on war. Him and he started to really come around to Dr. King. And he was the real like hope of the true progressive left at that time. Yep. Uh, and so this, I just want to read some excerpts from this article. That's again, uh, Kennedy's in the um, And it's basically just kind of a review of the book, the real history of the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy uh, from Lisa Pease. And it says, it's a rare thing indeed when a book actually delivers everything you could wish for. And then some, uh, <laughs> so, uh, it talks about Robert Kennedy's encounter with an unspeakable, uh, in the pantry, of the ambassador hotel on the night of June 5th, 1968, a lie too big to fail will no doubt stand the test of time as the definitive book on the RFK murder piece. The author establishes not only the most compelling case against the LAPD's compromised non-investigation of the case to date, my understanding to date, Sirhan Sirhan is still serving life in prison, um, but also reveals, the book reveals startling new discoveries, including previously unexplored forensic evidence, new witnesses to multiple shooters, and evidence of foul play at the highest levels of the United States political apparatus. So that right there, and we know, I mean, one of the things we know, because of new technology and forensics and DNA, cases have been reopened, they've found murders. I mean, like uh, some of these true crime podcasts have solved crimes um, by get open by, by DNA uh, evidence that w wasn't, you know, they didn't have the technology back then. Well, I, yeah, and I, and I haven't studied the, ro the Robert Kennedy Murder is probably the one I've studied the least out of MLK, JFK. Um, but as I recall, uh, this one guy had a revolver with six bullets and he fired 42 bullets, I believe, at uh, Robert Kennedy. So <laughs> I mean, it, doesn't, it doesn't really add up. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh yeah he, some, it's, he somehow shot him in the back of the head while standing in front of him it's pretty incredible yeah and the whole thing about it is and because there was still people and even to this day but back then still people screaming about jfk and the grassy knoll and and the magic bullet people were kind of like and and i think the deep state used this as an advantage and got people in 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 the media and politicians to go, come on, it was unfortunate, it was awful, but let's not go down another conspiracy grassy knoll road. Like that's, it was a tragedy. It was awful. Let's just, let's just be done with it. And I think some, some people might've been okay with that. And they utilized the sort of American public's, you know, yeah. at the time you got to understand. So it was, so April of, of, of 68 MLK was assassinated. Um, Malcolm X, I believe, was assassinated then. And then 
Malcolm X was before somewhat, but sixty seven ish, maybe yeah, early sixty eight. I can't remember, but um, so I think they they really took advantage of the uh, everyone just like Vietnam and another assassination and uh, you know forget it. And that's how they've been able to kind of keep people from asking questions about this one. Uh, yeah, Malcolm X was sixty five. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. People were people were sick of it, and they and and you know they they just didn't want to. Uh, you know, it's very tough to think that like elements of your own government are willing to take out so many uh, powerful and popular leaders. Uh, I mean, and and I think he was taken. I think Robert Kennedy was taken out for what he stood for. I think he was also taken out because they suspected, and I think it's pretty likely that. He knew that his brother had, although he never said it publicly. I don't. I don't even know if there's even a a, a you know the the innuendo of it. But he knew his brother wasn't killed by the lone shooter out of the you know book depository, and and uh, he knew what his brother was up against with the CIA and everything. And he was you know inside those fights where JFK was yep. going up against them on things like the the Bay of Pigs, which was it seems the the Bay of Pigs was basically a setup to try and force JFK's hand to invade Cuba, and he didn't go for it. Uh, obviously, he agreed to allow the initial invasion, which was dumb. But uh, he then, when they they knew it would fail and they thought it would force him into Cuba and he refused to invade Cuba. Um, so uh, I think his brother kind of knew that something far more sinister had gone on in the uh, execution of his brother. And they probably didn't want, you know, the, the deep state the CIA didn't want that at the top of the government either. Oh, yeah, because if he becomes president, if Bobby becomes president, then it's like all the stuff JFK had started. I mean, JFK said, I want to scatter the I want to smash the CIA up into a thousand pieces and scatter it into the wind. You know, he gave Mm -hmm. he gave a speech um, that's on YouTube that people say this is the speech that probably got him killed, where he talks about there's a secret there's a secret government, you know, out there. And so, of course, Bobby knew about that. He was attorney general. His brother was president. So, of course, he knew all about that. And they're like, "If, if he becomes president, then we're all going to get outed. And because, again, he was so popular, Bobby was so popular, he was not going to lose. I mean, literally, he, it, was, it, was, it was nuts. And that's why this is so... They, 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 <laughs> they had to... I mean, they literally had to stop him. And then you talk about LAPD, which I'm shocked LAPD did something nefarious. Just, I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> Living here, they've been so fantastic just the last few months. Um, yeah, this, this is a group of cops that, you know, as soon as they can't keep their pants up because of all the extra guns and coke and crack they have on them to drop on people they've killed to make it look like they were carrying it. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. Not to mention like uh, all the steroids they buy and use illegal steroids. Like, um, yeah, but- I did it. I did it. This is another government secret of our cops. I did a whole segment on Redacted tonight about how there's very few studies, but estimates are the few studies that have been. The estimates are 25 percent of cops in urban areas are abusing steroids, and of course, they're never tested for this. Like, there is absolutely no testing for cop abuse of steroids, which causes them to uh, you know make terrible decisions, quick to anger, violence prone, all that shit, and they're not even tested after they kill someone or like you'd think i mean if we give a fuck whether someone is juicing when they throw a stick really far at the olympics then you'd think as a society we might care whether a cop is juicing when they (laughs) murder an unarmed person i don't know yeah i know if a guy if a guy can hit a baseball too far because of steroids i don't know that it's worrisome that a a guy with a gun and a badge is out of control (laughs) um yeah, it's it's insane, and 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 also what this book comes up with is the author digs into the court records and transcripts of the also compromised defense attorney who sold the twenty four year old Sirhan Sirhan down the river before he ever had a chance at anything approaching a fair trial. So this is just like how they oh we got yeah. him oh and it's always oh some lone crazy guy. Yep. You know, and they do this all the time. I mean, they do this, uh, you know, they with the 
the sex trafficking. Oh, Jerry Sandusky, one crazy guy, one right. priest, just one bad, you know, one bad coach in that school because they don't want to find out that, oh, they're getting in for alumni and <laughs> donors and Les Wexner was probably whatever. Like, it's always that they, they paint the person as mentally unstable and one crazy yes. bad guy. Yeah, one 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 horrible person did this, and uh, you know it. And then they, like, obviously with JFK, they eliminated the person because uh, they didn't want uh, Oswald to talk. And then with uh, with MLK, uh, James Earl Ray, eventually he was pressured by he's he's very he was very rather poor and not bright person, but he didn't kill. Martin Luther King, but the his a court appointed attorney or whatever told him the only way for you to get an actual trial is if you just sign this confession. So he signed the conf- he signed the confession ultimately because he was told it was the only way to get a trial. And when he found out that wasn't true, he wasn't going to get the trial. He uh, recanted his confession and until his deathbed, never again said he had killed MLK. Oh, and it just and it fit a perfect narrative. Oh. Poor white guy hated him. Poor yeah. Southern white guy hated hated MLK rather than the CIA. I mean, like, especially when you get the FBI who was monitoring all of these people, you know, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Um, so it's really, it's, 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 I, I want to get this, I want to read this book for starters and I want to go more into this because. Um, I had her on, I had, was it Lisa Pease? I had her on redacted tonight vip uh we did not talk much about robert kenny we talked a lot more because i think she also put about put out a book about jfk and so we talked more about that but yeah yeah it's it's amazing um she talks about you know this book uh it, it, it's it's she goes all into it and I, I actually was in the ambassador hotel it used to be now it's a school um but the ambassador you had, hotel a, you was had the, a gig there was uh <laughs> during during the during the JFK murder tour. I mean yeah, it was murder tour. <laughs> you were the tour guide. You were like, I come on like, and see these bullet holes, folks. They are hilarious. Oh, look at the no way this could have happened in this hallway. Um <laughs> the, it was a movie shoot. They were it was an old hotel they kept the Ambassador Hotel and you could rent it out for movie shoots. And twenty years ago I was shooting this short film and they have a little dot on the ground where it happened unfortunately and you're just kind of like, wow, this is and then you watch the footage and crazy crowded hallway. So it could have, you know, like mm-hmm. you create a chaos, you, you kettle somebody into it and it's easy to make it seem like, Oh, this could have happened. Right. And, and it's on, un, it's undoubtable that Sirhan Sirhan was there and held up a gun, I think, cause there's photos of that, but it seems like the number of bullets fired and the actual kind of like, execution shot was as i understand it was likely not fired by him uh and uh rfk jr uh you know who's still around today and does a bunch of environmental work and stuff like that uh he said he does not believe sirhan sirhan was the killer and i think there was this article a couple of years ago where a, a CI, former CIA agent or something or a security guard or something connected to the CIA died. And RFK Jr. said he believed that was the guy. Well, th- that's interesting you bring that up because, again, in this book, um, Peace talks about the immediate aftermath of the shooting is where there's even more controversy in government secrets, which is the LAPD concluded um, Uh, or we will see, decided actively to conclude with the urging of two former CIA interrogation experts who took over the investigation within days after the murder. So uh, that right there is shady. Mm -hmm. Why would the CIA need, why is the CIA, why are they investigating a murder that's LAPD? Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I get if the FBI, because it's the president, but why is the CIA involved in this? Like, yeah, I mean that's another thing that's common with these with almost all of these is that basically immediately afterwards the murder scene is just destroyed. Yep. <laughs> like like yep. they, they they come through with a fucking weed whacker and just clear out the place and uh that happened with after Martin Luther King cuz Martin Luther King was shot 
you know, uh, the famous balcony photo. He was shot while he was standing on that balcony from a bunch of hedges, tall hedges that were uh, in front of uh, the bar and grill, the back of the bar and grill that faced that hotel. And the following day, the Memphis, you know, municipal whatever comes through and cuts all of the hedges away and cuts everything away and just destroys the murder scene. And also, A, makes it look like no one could have been hiding in those hedges because there now are no hedges. And also makes it look like uh, James O'Reilly could have fired the shot from his hotel room when, in fact, there were hedges or trees in front of his hotel room. So it, it, it just like just, they just destroy the murder scene and they act like, oh, what? It was just standard maintenance. You know, the, the, the city just <laughs> happened to be clearing out all of the bushes <laughs> that yes. day. And I, I love that we're supposed to believe that. That just like, oh well, hey, it was Hedges Day. Sorry, that's <laughs> yeah. It was it was standard Hedges Day. And then with Malcolm uh, X, uh, which by the way, everyone should watch the Netflix on that because that's another fucking mind blowing thing. I mean, we should we should really just do that as a topic, you know, in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a Netflix a recent Netflix show on on who the real killers are of of Malcolm X, and. Uh, after that, after he was killed in that ballroom, uh, they within hours, they go ahead and have a dance that was supposed to happen that night. They went ahead with it with bullet holes still in the walls. Like yeah. you've got like smoking bullet holes in the walls. And they're like, for this next dance, ladies, you get to pick wow. the guy. Like, <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't want to lock off a crime scene. It's not like that's kind of standard procedure in a murder investigation. It's yeah. Like and then I, well, I can't remember what it was like 20 or 30 years after the assassination, someone was kind of doing, uh, you know, I don't know if they were investigating it again or they were just writing a report on it or whatever it was, but they went down into the basement and found the bullet ridden podium just in storage in the basement of the place. 30 years later, no one had ever collected this bullet ridden podium and thought this might be uh, a useful evidence. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Is it is a bullet hole or a, a, a shell casing or any of that stuff valuable in a murder investigation? I don't know. I'm not a cop, so it seems like maybe it's I, nothing. I, I mean, it's amazing, and it's not just incompetence. It's this goes way beyond incompetence. This goes to we really want everyone to not look into this. Oh, it's so clear. It's that standard like whisk this away, don't ask questions. Um, believe this nonsense but part of the believing of the nonsense is sort of that mob like it's an almost an intimidation tactic of like yeah i see you start asking too many questions then you're gonna fall down a flight of stairs you know that'd be a real shame you know if a <laughs> set of knives jumped up and attacked you on your couch you know what i mean that'd be a real bummer wouldn't it now it's really like <laughs> that's what it feels like to me so you know these these knives these days these high-tech knives they'll just come after you i've seen it happen i really have i know guys walking it's, it's like somebody walking home late you know what i mean bad things happen it's just awful you know and it happened while i was uh having dinner with a bunch of alibis you know like well what's, <laughs> why would you phrase it that way <laughs> Uh, me, me, and my we we do alibi Thursday. We always get together, We're always, and, uh, <laughs> always, and we have yeah, we just have a, a really great alibi night. Yeah, we post photos and we just it's, yeah, any old friend. It's just great. It's just great. Here's us in this restaurant. It's great. <laughs> um, so that's my that's like the the gov seeks uh, I wanted to bring up because um, I would recommend first of all the audience going to Kennedy's and the and King dot com. And then and then go through this article and 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 I want to get this book as well because it's it's really um, it's it's she talks about a lie too big to fail achieves a fine balance between the immense complexity of the case with the thousands of files, its bizarre subjects and characters, its hypno programming realities, and other strange but relevant source data, which is how they get these things swallowed by the American public. They make it complex. They ask questions, anything to keep everybody sort of off the trail and getting and what they're what they're very good at is keeping everybody divided. You know, well, and and I'd say one of the other keys 
one of the other keys is you get the, the the mainstream media, the legacy media, you know, the New York Times and the 60 Minutes and all these to do segments about how, you know, some people have they basically throw some of the questions in there. Like some people have wondered about why this bullet hole is blah, blah, blah. But then they answer their own questions and they say, well, it's it's funny you should ask that because it turns out that it was Sirhan Sirhan after all. And and they basically just put it on the kind of permanent record. New York Times uh, addressed this issue and shot it all down. You know, that I, I, I call the legacy media and everything, I call them the white blood cells because anytime there's an infection uh, for the na- the propaganda narrative, they attack it mercilessly. Oh, and, and now we're seeing, I mean, I've showed this, there's this thing called the propaganda multiplier, which is so it all comes down from the State Department and they, they feed it to all the networks. And now... It's even they know how to sell the narrative like the Netflix. um, We've talked about this, the Netflix Epstein special. It gave the uh, the witnesses or the the victims, it gave them a voice, which was great. And these victims would say these things like this powerful Mm -hmm. person, this powerful person. And then they would just cut to some other thing. And it was and and I, I talked to sort of friends of mine that you know, aren't paying as much attention or whatever. And, they're, you know, they're smart, fun people, but they're just not. And, and I hear them say, yeah, I mean, how could the Clintons have known? Like, and I'm like, oh, so that was the purpose of that Netflix documentary is to, so they keep planting right. all of these seeds and they've done it with both of the Kennedy assassinations. And again, all that stuff you just said about James Earl Ray and the hedges, I didn't know much of that. You know, I just knew, oh, James Earl Ray killed MLK. So they just hammered that point home. James O'Reilly, James O'Reilly, James O'Reilly did it. James O'Reilly did it. James Sirhan Sirhan, Sirhan Sirhan, Lee Harvey Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald. And so then everything else just can be easily drowned out by some quick little, well, we did one study and that showed this. So, all right. Yeah. uh, And if if someone wants to learn more about uh, MLK, I can't remember the name of the book, but I had the author on Redacted Tonight. And, uh, you know, for, for, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is his name. His name is Dr. Pepper. OK, you just have to you just have to accept it and move on. Um, but uh, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Pepper, uh, he he was actually MLK's. Uh, well, he was a he, he was a, fr- a friend of MLK in his final year, and he became the lawyer for the King family when they had a trial. And in 1999, the only trial ever held about the death of Martin Luther King. And after 70 witnesses, the jury came back that the killer of of Martin Luther King was not James Earl Ray, but was, uh, um, Lloyd Jowers, the the owner of the bar there, along with uh, government forces, quote unquote, government forces, both state and uh, wow. federal. And that is the only trial ever held on Martin Luther King. And the New York Times has a little from 1999. The New York Times has a little back page article that's about one paragraph long that that just shrugs it off and says uh, it wasn't a real trial because the government didn't really care about it, basically because the government failed to present a uh, good defense or a good, you know, uh, explanation of what happened. That means the trial didn't matter. Uh, and they just kind of shoot it down, but they do acknowledge it exists. And that is the only trial I ever had. And anyway, uh, Dr. Pepper has put out uh, multiple books. I mean, you should read the most recent one because he keeps kind of updating his, his past knowledge. And uh, the, the most recent one basically says who the who the killer was which was a it was a memphis police officer uh but he was put up to it by you know larger higher level forces uh connected to um uh the cia and hoover and uh it was done with coordination of the owner of that bar and grill. So basically the Memphis PD sharpshooter takes the shot. He then hands a the gun to Lloyd Jowers. Lloyd Jowers goes into the bar, breaks the gun down, you know, puts it in a bag to dispose of. And Jowers was still alive uh, in his nineties at the time of this 1999 trial and confessed to what to being involved in this. Uh, and this was all in the trial. Yeah. And of course, none of it comes out. Well, 
All right, that's my that's my government secret segment. Um, so <laughs> maybe, we'll gonna... do, maybe, maybe we'll save a whole other segment some future week for MLK and another segment some future week for Malcolm X because they they deserve it. But we could talk about Fred Hampton. I mean, we could keep you know, like yeah. they just yeah. wiped every progressive lefty leader, especially when they started unifying people. When 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 Malcolm X and MLK started to get on the same page, uh huh. That's yep. when they're like, uh oh, like we can keep you as long if you guys are gonna divide the black community great but once they started getting together it was like Ooh, we got to get rid of these guys you know like anytime you unify people you're gone <laughs> one one of the things that blew my mind perhaps the most in that mlk and i'll just uh, sorry malcolm x uh netflix documentary series uh and i'll save the rest for some future segment but was malcolm x has his you know close-knit security guards uh, a week before or less than a week before his house had been firebombed. So he's got these security guards around him and everything, but that doesn't mean security was that tight. There's no one checking people for guns when they walk in. I mean, that also wasn't common back then, but he's got this tight knit security team that he trusts and he's shot, you know, two, two gunmen come up, basically just fill him with bullets and, and leave. And the guy who gives Malcolm X mouth to mouth and tries to save him is a high the one the top of his security team uh secretly nypd what yeah the nypd had wow. infiltrated his security team to the top and Jesus. so the the guy who gave him mouth to mouth was nypd and you have like interviews with other former police chiefs who are you know s- say yeah, you know, after he was shot, our infiltrator uh, gave him mouth to mouth, which I don't understand that at all. I don't look. I'm I'm not saying shoot the guy, but if he gets shot, you're going to try and save him? Are you kidding me? Oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's just crazy, crazy. Anyway, speaking of executions, shall we move to the next topic? <laughs> Government secret segment ever two. <laughs> This is this is this is a blood covered episode, it really is. It really is. This is a, a blood covered episode. Um, I I wanted to talk. I talked about unredacted tonight, so I wanted to continue the discussion here. But uh, recently, federal death penalties have continued again, uh, restarted after seventeen years. Uh, they've already killed at least two or three people, and the, here's the secret part of it. The biggest secret part of it is that. The, the Trump administration, the Justice Department have secretly been testing and amassing, amassing execution drugs. Uh, this was uh, covered in, in several outlets. Uh, I, I think I got it from either Reuters or Guardian or something. But um, but it came out recently uh, that they were secretly amassing these drugs because foreign governments refuse to make the lethal injection drugs that we use because apparently Governments have a a moral qualm about, uh, you know, uh, executing people with lethal injection, but building bombs, every country's fine with that totes cool. Totes cool. <laughs> but, oh, I love mental gymnastics. They're so fun. <laughs> they keep you loose. They keep you spry. you like, oh, killing people with a drug, that's evil. But setting them on fire from above, that is gold. Yeah, the um, mental gymnastics here is, uh, I mean, these are feet behind the head. This is some serious shit. This is like the Cirque du Soleil of, of this is just fantastic what they're doing. Oh. The, they're so, these guys are so good at mental gymnastics. They suck their own dick. That's how extremely <laughs> they are deep into this, deep, deep into this. <laughs> That's what you know. They're, they're really, you can suck your own dick. Man, you have won. So anyway, they couldn't get the drugs. So what they started doing was telling pharmaceutical and lab companies that they were, you know, oh, they need the, oh, they wouldn't say who it was for. And they would say it was for something else. So it was like, oh, we, you know, need to kill a lot of horses and very large horses. And, uh, and <laughs> they would, they would say There's, it was. Are there too many horses running around? That's what we're supposed to believe. Just yeah. wild horses trampling our schools. Yeah. Is that yeah. going down? Yeah. So they got these labs to amass and test these drugs. And at least the labs claim that they didn't know who they were for, didn't know what they were for. Um, so the first dental death penalties have, have gone forward uh, in 17 years, federal death penalties. And 
I mean, it's just that, that, uh, at what point do you think you start to think to yourself, you know, maybe we're not doing the right thing. Maybe we're on the wrong side of history. Is it when you have to secretly collect death drugs because other countries won't sell them to you because they think you're out of your goddamn mind. Is that the point that you start? Yeah, to- <laughs> it feels like they think like a drug addict. Like, when did you hit rock bottom? Was it like when you were uh, sucking dick behind the 7-Eleven for meth money? When was it? When did it hit you that maybe you went, wow, I'm having a moment of clarity. Like, hiding the death drugs, saying they're for horses. When do you think you've crossed the line? Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but I, 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 I've always, I've been a you know advocate for ending the death penalty for years now, and really kind of it's been one of my pet topics that I've worked more on than maybe some others, because uh, it really is just completely indefensible. I, I've, I, I've talked to people who support it, and there really is no fucking explanation for it at all. Uh, I mean. I mean, you have the you have the stuff that that most people don't know. For example, uh, that the the estimate is that between four and five percent of people executed are completely innocent, meaning had nothing to do with it. Okay, then of course there's a much larger percent who are severely mentally ill to the point that some of these people clearly don't even understand what it is they did or why they're being executed. Um, and then you have that the number one determinant of whether someone gets sentenced to the death penalty is race of the victim, race of the victim, because our society wow. is really upset when a white person dies. When a black person dies, apparently we don't give a fuck. Uh, so race of the victim is the number one determinant uh, in these <sighs> completely ridiculous death penalty cases. And then once you argue like everything and plus many of the family members, more of the family members come out and say they don't want the person executed than do usually. Uh, and then when you argue at all the, all the, all the points of supporting the death penalty, you usually get down to two reasons. One, one is people will say, well, it's an eye for an eye. And you go, okay, that's fine. Except that that is not how our legal system works in any other matter. If someone burns down your house, you don't sentence them to be on fire. If someone, <laughs> like, I, I'm not saying it wouldn't feel good, but if someone rapes someone, they're not sentenced to rape. If someone, even in the case of an eye for an eye, even in the case of an eye theft, they aren't sentenced to have their eyes stolen. This is never happens in any other aspect of our system except in killing. Yeah, I know. Oh, you stole a car? Well, there's a lot. There's like there's yeah. a car lot. Help yourself, friend. <laughs> just yeah, like- you just we'll we'll steal your car. It doesn't <laughs> It doesn't. In no other area do we do that. And then the other reason people will come down to is, well, it 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 feels good, all right, to to get that you know vengeance. Well, sure, maybe for some people it feels good. But if we legal if 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 legally we wrote things into law because they felt good, then like every, every law would be like, oh, this person hacked your emails. Well, they're sentenced to a a thousand paper cuts and you get to piss in their mouth. Like that would be every law. It'd just be, oh, it feels good. It feels good to, oh, that oil CEO gets dipped in a vat of uh, oil and and oatmeal and pecked to death by the birds that he threatened. Like, yeah, it feels good. It's not how our system works. The guy broke in and stole your money. Wow, you get to shit on his face. There you yeah, go. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, eye yeah. for an eye, brother. That's yeah. how it feels good. Yeah. So for no other in no other area do we do legal shit like that. Um, and then, you know, there's the brutality of our past death penalties, which the, I love this fun fact. The, the, the electric chair would likely never have existed, except that Thomas Edison was in a competitive race with Tesla and a a uh, a businessman named George Westinghouse and some, some people know this story Edison was for direct current Tesla and Westinghouse were for alternating current uh Tesla when he was working under Edison had tried to convince Edison to do alternating current and Edison said ah you young you whippersnapper you don't know what the fuck you're talking about and but Edison was losing the fight for uh for which current was going to you know cover America and become the the electricity delivery system of the of the future. And so his plan was to create 
an electric current that would kill someone and tell everyone that that was alternating current so that they all got scared of alternating current. So Edison proceeded to fund uh, a man named Southwick, invented the electric chair. Edison helped fund it. And they first did tests on animals. So there were a bunch of displays with reporters there of Edison electrocuting to death dogs, horses, and in one case, a circus elephant named Topsy. Well, Literally, Topsy had a rap sheet. I mean, let's be real clear here. Topsy. <laughs> I, listen, I think he was framed. I'm sorry. I disagree. I think he was framed. I think he was framed by a uh, VW bus. <laughs> wow. There's a lot of racketeering going on in the circus world. So it I don't know. A, Topsy was still in something. It was a VW bus in an elephant outfit that pulled <laughs> off the crime. I can promise you. I knew Topsy. He would never do anything like that. I don't know. I think Topsy had a secret dark side, buddy. I think it was it had a there was a there was a hidden darkness to Topsy that we were just finding out about. <laughs> On the next so, government secrets, it's the Topsy revealed. <laughs> and Topsy was told he'd get a fair trial if he just signed that confession form. And then he did. <laughs> and he was electrocuted. Uh but so there's like early video of this poor circus elephant in oh, Coney Island. God. Coney Island, in Coney Island being electrocuted to death for fucking no reason, for no reason whatsoever, except that Edison was a maniac. So then they do the, the first human electric chair. And it's a guy named, I think, Kemmler, uh, a convicted killer. And so they put him in the chair and they electrocute him. And then, you know, he goes limp and Southwick steps forward. The inventor steps forward and says something like, uh, we thank you folks for being here. We now live in a more civilized world. This is the fruition of a lot of work and effort. And we live in a more civilized world. That's when Kemmler starts moaning. <laughs> and they realize oh. they realize he was still alive in excruciating pain. And so the oh. Southwick steps out of the way and they go back to electrocuting him for like minutes until his head starts smoking. Oh my God. And then they, <laughs> again, I guess Southwick steps forward and goes, okay, now we live in a more civilized world. Oh, like uh, America is a, is a, <laughs> is a, a psycho chamber. Like we're just, a, we're like, we're the evil, crazy people. We're the villain in every movie that been, but we think we're the good guys. It's insane. We're just like, we, we, we say these things and don't even think they don't sound crazy to us. Like, Oh, we humanely murder people. I mean, that was a humane way to deal with justice. No, but you're not addressing any of it. It's like school shootings are up. Mm, better armed teachers. Listen to that sentence where there's a, there's a thing you're missing. <laughs> It's in, it's like it's like boy we have an obesity epidemic we need federally funded bigger belts like it's just <laughs> goes to, we are uh, the most insane out of touch country that's ever existed. Well, we one of the biggest things we do is we anytime there's a good idea we run screaming from it like it's a hive of angry bees that all want to talk to you about your life insurance like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just we are horrified by good ideas. Yes, um, I know. As as, yeah. as with Tesla and alternating current, so so Edison uh, thinks he's accomplished this. This I'm going to make the whole American public ter terrified of alternating current, and they'll all go to direct current. But all of this electrocuting of animals and. Uh, killers had the reverse effect where people did not care what type of current had killed these things. They just were horrified of electricity. <laughs> ah, well, that's that might be a good uh, silver lining in this horrific cloud. <laughs> oh, yeah, but like, don't but don't touch the silver lining. It's electrified and you'll die. You're going to die. Yeah. Great. So everyone's just terrified that look at the thing that killed Topsy. I'm not plugging that into the wall. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Hey, don't listen. I know we want Christmas lights, but uh, that stuff killed Topsy. Okay, can you I mean, can you just back up? It's like maybe Topsy was framed by Dumbo. We'll never know at this point. But I'm not going near that. <laughs> I'm terrified. I'm terrified of holding this microphone as we talk right now. <laughs> but the the death penalty has always been such a horrific, ridiculous. I mean, god awful. 
Uh, mm-hmm. and, 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 you know, I, I think we on the, maybe the first episode or something, I talked about how most of the forensic, quote unquote, forensic science that is used to convict people of these death penalty crimes, you know, the arson experts and the tooth bite experts, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. These, sci- these quote unquote sciences are not sciences. Uh, as I, as I, I remember covering on an earlier episode, they sent out, a, a tooth bite sample to everybody in the who is an official and and licensed tooth bite expert. They sent out a sample and said, you know, is this a, a child's tooth bite? Is this an adult tooth bite or is this not a tooth bite? And literally it was like a third, a third and a third, meaning they couldn't agree at all whether it was even a tooth bite. And this is the shit that is getting people convicted for like life sentences and death penalties and shit. Oh God. We have so, America is so broken on like a thousand levels. Like were we ever fixed? Maybe did we start broken? I feel like we started broken. I like <laughs> America. I, I think we were, I think we were working fine when we were uh, massacring all the native Americans. I think we were, I think That's when America was at its best. Right? We were at it's our stupid. best. Smooth, yeah. smooth running. Smooth, smooth running. Oh, let's make America great again. You know, Japanese internment camps, women can't vote, genocide, slavery, fantastic stuff. Um, do you have a, uh, in these last 10 minutes, uh, another topic? I do have another topic, another gum secrets uh, segment number three. <laughs> <laughs> um. So this is something, you know, you and I have both uh, talked about a lot um, because it's it's one of these government secrets that everybody was made public and then everybody just kind of pretends like it didn't happen. Yeah. Just like, oh, it's just the uh, topsy went away, you know, like something. <laughs> um, this report that came out and it came out a little over a year ago in February of 2019, that the U.S. killed more civilians in Afghanistan than the Taliban. This is a shocking UN report that came out. And oh, yeah. I'm just going to, uh, this, yeah, and you and I, I, I know we both covered it uh, over a year ago. So it's a year and a half ago now. Um, and it's, it's the, a report from the United, and the United Nations report that U.S. and its allies in Afghanistan have been responsible for more civilian deaths in the country than the Taliban, who they're supposed to be fighting. What a damning indictment of U.S. foreign policy and engagement. And since that time, we've had the Afghanistan papers. We've had like all yep. of this. And yet we're still in Afghanistan. We're coming up on year, like October will be 19 years of officially at war with them. I mean, we sent people on the ground on September 11th. We apparently airlifted in special ops people or whatever. But like, when is America, especially now, especially like as Steve Mnuchin just said, this extra $600 is disincentivizing people to work. This is what a psycho who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars says. Right. That, and they, 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 that's him saying, listen, we've been effectively exploiting your labor for generations and we're not going to stop now. All right. So please get back out there, folks. All right. Get your, get your head in the game. The audacity of these people who, first of all, all these companies got $4.25 trillion in the CARES Act. They get tax, like Amazon doesn't pay taxes. Right. They, they, even in this last three, four months of the, of the, of the quarantine, these people have made hundred, like 400 some billion dollars. And then they don't, they, oh, I, oh, that's 600. I'm sick of you freeloaders. Freeloaders, you assholes haven't worked a day in your life. And yet what the thing that ties in is they're hemming and hawing over 600 bucks. Yet we have trillions of dollars to go to this never ending war in Afghanistan. The, the America's longest war. No one talks about it in the mainstream media. This is the longest well, well, war. And they'll, and they'll run around with, with a horseshit story like Russia's paying the Taliban to kill U.S. Right. troops. And if you were a reporter with even the, a modicum of ethics or education who gave a shit, who wanted to be a serious human being on any level, then you would at least have one sentence in that article, which is, you know, complete horse shit that says, oh, by the way, the U.S. has killed more innocent civilians than the Taliban. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, oh, by the way. So even the mission that we're doing there is we've been feeling for 19 years like 
I was there as a comedian in 2004 and 2006 and 2007. But between but let's be and honest, and... a front lines comedian. All right. Fr- you, were, <laughs> you were out there doing your part. You would make, was, it was a secret weapon. You would make the Taliban laugh. And right then the U.S. troops would attack. If I can get the Taliban to laugh at one of my dick jokes, we will win. <laughs> Hearts and minds, Lee. Yep. Hearts and minds. That's true. Um, but like, we that got reminds the me of your killer farts and minds joke. You have a, <laughs> your, your farts and minds bits. I, it gets me every time. Oh, thanks, buddy. That's why I sold a lot of merch with that. Uh, with that slogan. <laughs> <laughs> that, that bit put a lot of max, backs on mattresses. <laughs> a lot of backs on mattresses. Um, uh, so that, um, I remember in 04, you know, we got the Taliban out of power and then rather than rebuilding the country and doing, you know, similar to what we did with the Marshall plan after world war II, um, which that's what Afghanistan should be. If we literally were doing it the way we said we were or correctly right now, we'd be like, Oh, now there's commercial flights into Kabul and we've spent all this money on hospitals and schools and roads and we're bringing afghanistan into the 21st century and nah, we just have blown it up and by killing more civilians we create more terrorists more taliban more everybody hates us like it's just and it's a waste of money we're killing innocent civilians we have troops that come home we have 22 vets a day to commit suicide like it's just and it's it's never talked about it's talked about like it's some sort of like highway law that was passed in a state or something just some sort of sidebar <laughs> like you know like oh alabama might add a, a, a yeah. diamond lane oh okay right. oh well alabama's gonna let people drive at uh, 16 instead of 17 that's interesting oh, well, that's good law yeah. I could, could we did that like <laughs> oh by the way we're we're making everything worse and so i can't listen to one single we don't have the money for it or we're disincentivizing yeah. americans when this shit is going on no i i mean there's so much of what you're saying that's that's so important i i talked about the money the, the whole idea of we don't have enough money is uh, of course laughable on its face uh, as you as you said 4.25 trillion in this latest bailout uh david day at american prospect called it the largest theft uh, america's ever seen uh given to corporate leaders in wall street uh, and it, meanwhile, Mnuchin acts like they don't have enough money to uh, keep people in their jobs or make sure there's there's an eviction freeze so people are not kicked out of their homes. I mean, this it really is so revolting when the when the GOP and Mnuchin say, oh, people should not get paid for staying home and doing nothing. But. We, the average workers of this country, built this society through our labor, our effort, our energy, our lifeblood. You know, we are owed a functioning country that can protect us from a crisis like this. And instead, we are not getting that. We are getting a failed state that is doing nothing to help the people while giving trillions to the ruling elite. And as you also mentioned, uh, the the billionaires have have collected over five hundred billion dollars since this thing started. Uh, Jeff Bezos is now worth one hundred and ninety billion dollars. And I don't know if Facebook changed their algorithm or something, but I had my first viral post in four years, even though I have a very large Facebook page. But they've basically not allowed anything to succeed for four years. Uh, My first viral post in four years was a, a uh, people can see it at facebook.com slash Lee Camp Comedian, but it got like 80,000 shares. And it was a, uh, a photo of Jeff Bezos mentioning that he now has $190 billion. The average American worker makes $32,000 a year before the pandemic. And if the average worker were to save every penny and not be taxed, how long would it take them to have the amount Jeff Bezos has? They'd only have to work for 5.9 million years. Okay, well, now there we go. Now that's something to achieve. I mean, so you're uh, saying there's a chance. <laughs> so put that on your vision board, everybody. Yeah, put it, put it on your vision board. Put a, just, ta- tack a little photo of Bezos up there and uh, just and just get to work. Five some million years, you're going to be just like Jeff Bezos because the system is just work hard and you'll succeed. That's what the system is set up to do. The other thing that drives me nuts like about Mnuchin and all this stuff, talking about the $600 is... There's no mention of how precarious the economy was before COVID-19. Mm-hmm. The 60% of the population that couldn't afford a $500 to $1,000 emergency. Well, let me tell you something. One showed up in March. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a slight one. 
a slight one showed up and that that even if you had a grand, you paid rent one month. Maybe there's, you know, each month there's another uh, percentage, a higher percentage of people who aren't able to pay their bills. And this, you know, I mean, people who are barely getting by and some people, well, they're making more money now with unemployment than they were beforehand. Good. Because beforehand yeah. they were making slave wages. Like, what right. are you talking about? Right. Good, good. Because they were being heavily, they and we, you know, average workers heavily exploited. Uh, you know, like the, uh, the the minimum wage in 1968 was like one something, one dollar and 60 something cents. And if it had kept pace with uh, productivity and purchasing power, it would now be $24 an hour. That's right. what people should be making, but they're not. The federal minimum wage is still seven twenty-five or whatever the fuck, and so it, it, it's the exploitation has just multiplied. I, I mean, the the idea that they can't keep everybody in their homes during this disaster is just fucking. Uh, disgusting. It's repulsive. And other countries are doing it. Other countries are keeping their unemployment low by paying corporations and companies only to keep their workers. We will give that company money if you keep people on the books as workers. Like it, This is not an impossible idea. It's just that our ruling elite is, uh, it, it, you know, we, we are late stage capitalism beyond most other countries and sociopaths in this system rise to the top. And those who are not sociopathic enough, those who have any level of empathy for uh, others, for people below them, for people who have a more difficult time, you will not get to that top. You will not get to that boardroom. Yeah. That boardroom is reserved for sociopaths only. There's a little <laughs> sign on the door. <laughs> yes, yes, you have to take a sociopath test. And if you're not willing to do it, then uh, you're not getting in. Yeah, it's unbelievable, man. And we can't even like fighting for $15 an hour minimum wage is like a struggle. And that's still $9 below what it should be yeah. compared to and CEO wages have gone through the roof. Mm -hmm. They've gone through the roof, man. And it's like, and yet, uh, and yet, right now in this pandemic, who are we finding out are the actual essential workers? Are they like, uh, oh, the essential workers are the CEOs. You guys better get out there. Fuck no. They're like, no. the essential workers are the guys stocking the shelves. The guy no, driving the truck. The guy who has a sandwich in a pail is the essential worker. Yeah, no one's banging their pots at 8 o'clock at night for a billionaire. Nobody's doing that. Nobody's cheering for anybody. We're seeing it, and that's why, like, Workers really need to unionize, really need to force this. And I, I mean, I don't know, like, if Steve Mnuchin and them get it, like, the 28 million, we've talked about this on, on previous episodes, the 28 million um, evictions that are happening. And they're in states all over America. And I looked at that map mm -hmm. that they showed percentage of renters in each oh, state. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a bunch of red states. It's a bunch of Trump supporters. It's between like these, 35 and 50% in most states. In most states. And the, then these red states are in the 40 percentile to 50 yeah. percentile. Yeah. And there's plenty of blue states too, but like there's not one state below 22%. I mean, the good states are in the 25 or under 30%. I mean, there's a bunch of states in the 30s and there's, I mean, it, it's, it's ridiculous. And so when these people can't pay their bills and you took away that $600, what's going to happen? I mean, like it, it, it's, it's, I don't think they realize this unless they're trying to make this happen or they're just so greedy and dumb that I don't know, I don't know what they think is going to go down in the next like six months. Well, I, I hope the people that in these dark times, and I realize this isn't going to put, you know, anyone back in their house, but I hope people start to realize uh, that this system's kind of a fraud. I mean, there's no reason that right. you should have to be working so hard. There's no reason that everybody shouldn't be housed in this post-scarcity world in which we live. Uh, there's no reason for any of this. It's just that we have an economic system that has been pounded into our heads since birth, and we don't even realize there's a different way of doing it. We don't even realize that literally all we'd have to do is decide that our society was going to handle these things and we could do it. Uh, it's, I mean, they can 3d print a house in hours. Like everyone right. could have their own 3d printed house and they, the cost of it is $4,000. Like literally they could just be like, Hey everybody, we've got uh 20, you know, 200,000 houses. We just printed uh, over the past few months. Just uh, come on out here. We'll give it to you for, uh, you know, free. Just come on in. 
Yeah, here's a house. We'll just, we'll just, you got to pay the truck. We'll get, you got to pay a hundred bucks for the truck to deliver it. And, uh, <laughs> and you get a house. Yeah. Um, and all the money we're spending on war. Uh, that's the other, that's the, that's the other government secret is that we're. Oh, and the F, by the way, the, the F 35 is in the fucking bill, the latest bill oh. that they're trying to get through. There's 600 some million dollars for the F 35. Unbelievable. We don't have, we can't do student debt forgiveness. That'd be a crime, but we've yeah. got the same amount of money. $1.5 trillion is the total cost, if not higher now for the, for the F-35. Oh man. All right. Well, there's a government secret. There it is. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we are a ray of sunshine. I know on this show, but uh, I'd rather have the truth than the bullshit. Yeah. I'd rather have the truth too. Um, so, yeah, I, I support everything I'm doing, Graham uh, you know, my show, Political Vigilante. Everything's at GrahamElwood.com. I have a new uh, round of Vigilante tea. I have a loose-leaf tea. This is Vigilante tea Volume 2, <laughs> The Dark Knight. There's only 50 units made. They're numbered. Uh, and there's all these things on sale on my website. And I, course, my favorite kind of merch is uh, pun merch. So <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that's happening. It's my second round of pun merch. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, so you, my Patreon, Rockfin, all that stuff. If you're new to what I'm doing, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, support me on the Patreon, Rockfin, all that stuff. It's all at uh, GrahamElwood.com. I'm at LeeCamp.com. That's where you can find my book, my new book, Bullet Points and Punchlines, uh, with an intro by Jimmy Dore, forward by Chris Hedges. Um, my comedy special is free at LeeCampAmerican.com. All my stuff is at, all the Redacted Tonight. My TV show is at Lee, is at YouTube.com slash Redacted Tonight. And uh, although I don't normally promote my Facebook because of all the fucking shit that goes on there, uh, they, they have allowed things, it seems, to actually go viral recently. So who knows? Maybe they're changing their ways. Doubt it. But uh, uh, that's at Facebook.com slash Lee Camp Comedian. All right. And this is Government Secrets. We're, de- we're trying to get it on iTunes and Stitcher and Spotify and all that. In the meantime, you can just go to the Lipson link. Um, and if you are listening to this, please share that out on your social media and just do hashtag Government Secrets and tag both Lee and I um, on whatever your social media is. Uh, so thank you for listening.